everyone. And if anybody wants to be recorded and they have a question, does anyone have a question? Stuart, it's Chris. I have a question. Um, is the the mantra Soham the same thing as I am that from the Torah in the burning bush? Is it the same idea? I am that I am? Well, yes. It's exactly the same idea. One of them is in Sanskrit and the other one is in I guess English and Hebrew, you know. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. Okay, it's wonderful. I mean, you translate so hum, it means I am that. Right. I am that. I am that I am, and you know. I mean, it's a very powerful mantra because it really means that one is surrendering to everything in the universe. It means that one is letting go of ego, mind, everything, you know, to be one with God when you inhale and say so and exhale and say hum. It's a powerful mantra. It also is very good to get the mind quiet, to get the emotions quiet, to relax you. You know, I mean, you got to realize every time you inhale, it's I am, you're taking in life. When you exhale, it's that, you're letting go of life. I am one with everything. It's beautiful, thank you. You're welcome. And these are all important, this is a very important element. I mean, I don't teach a lot of mantra and stuff like that, you know? And there's certainly, I don't can't remember the last time I've had chanting. You know, I think I was living in Rudy's ashram the last time we did chanting. But simple exercises and mantras like so hum uh, can take you a long way in your inner work. And it's so simple to do. You just listen to your breathing. Eventually the breathing becomes so hum. The sound of the breath becomes so hum. I am that. I am one with everything. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? I have just a, an announcement to make. Um, on the 9th of uh, next month, uh, Daniel DeCosta is going to do an interview with me in English, you know, as a way of kind of promoting that book of mine that was translated into Portuguese. But it'll be in English, and if people want to attend the interview, you're welcome. It's going to be for about an hour and a half, and it'll be on Zoom. So you have to get in touch with Daniel, and he will send you a link you know, at the time when this is going to, the day that this is going to be done. You know, so I think that's a very good thing. I mean, the book is also here in, you know, in English, it's called, you know, I forgot what it's called, the river, you know, navigating the river of time. So if you'd like to attend that, I think it's going to be on a Monday morning at 11 o'clock my time. You know, you're welcome, but get in touch with Daniel and he will put you on the mailing list. You'll get a link. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Uh, yeah, Stuart, I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, so today was one of those burrowing through the mountain of tension kind of days and I felt like I was I was in my heart space and, and opening up but it wasn't necessarily sweet feelings 
um, is that is it even important? It felt like very like intense in the in the heart center. Is it good to work towards like a sweetness or or something, or does it matter? It's good to open it, and you'll find out what you have buried there, and then you let go of it. Because if you had any kind of negative energy you experienced when you opened the heart, that's what you buried there. And that's what's been keeping the heart from opening. And then you let it go. It, you draw it into the chakra system, that negativity, turn it into shakti, into energy that is nurturing you instead of you know, eventually you give you a heart attack, you know? So I, I you know, You know, there's nothing negative in this work. Everything can be used for a spiritual life. You open deep inside, you find tension, you find negativity. It's not a negative thing. It's just the opportunity to let go of these things that are, that are killing people, you know? And not to be afraid of them, because these are not negative energies. They're just things we've been holding on to in our life to keep ourselves from ever being happy, from literally killing ourselves, you know? And when it opens, these things come out. We need to get rid of them. So instead of, oh my God, I had some terrible thing happen, just let, take, draw it into the chakra system and let it really become part of the flow of energy. Bring it down below the navel and turn it into chi, which is harmony, rootedness, balance. And that's what the breathing is for. That's what the will is for. The need to grow is all about. The use of the proper use of the mind is all about. Transforming all of these things that are killing us into life-giving energies. So when you open inside and you have a negative, it's not that you're just releasing something that has been repressed maybe for five lifetimes inside you. And you have an opportunity to transform it in the meditation, into chi, into harmony, balance, and ultimately into love, because transforming that into chi will give you the strength to keep the heart open and to get rid of all of the crap that could be buried there. I mean, there's no negativity in this meditation. It's just a constant drilling and unfolding of consciousness and of things that we've repressed and buried in ourselves to lifetimes sometimes, you know, that have been there. And then it depends upon what you do with those things. If you close up again, then you've got the same problem all over again. But if you open and draw that tension down, you, you know, I mean, my God, you're doing yourself such a service that'll take you so far in the development of an inner life. And forget about even an inner life, just development of one's humanity. Thank you, that helps a lot. Just the opening and seeing what's there rather than opening and looking for something specific. Yeah, because you're not gonna find what you're looking for, Zach. <laughs> you're gonna find what's there, you know? And then you open it, and then the sweetness comes if you get rid of what that stuff. You know, there's always things that test it. I mean, I had a test today with UPS. <laughs> My God. They waited all day for them, and, they, and then they didn't come. <laughs> and what they were supposed to bring me is so important that I was like, oh, my God. You know, it's going to sit in their truck for another night, you know? It's probably the two best tantric works of art I've seen in 20 years, these things. And, I, you know, and I'm waiting for them and waiting. <laughs> <laughs> they never showed it. Then they showed up in the middle of what, thank God my daughter was there and she took care of it. God bless her.
So you never know where your dramas are going to come from. <laughs> UPS. Does anyone else have a question they would like to ask? Stuart, it's uh, Tony. Yes, Tony. And what you just said would pertain also to dealing with all the different levels and types of fear that we experience. What you just said would pertain to that also, right? All the different fears. I mean, look, you know, look, look at it this way, Tony. Fear is not an unhealthy thing. What makes it unhealthy is the mind gets involved, attaches itself to fear and creates a Frankenstein inside us. That's what makes it unhealthy. But fear is like, you know, in a fog, you have a buoy ringing a bell telling the ship that they're coming to rocks. It's telling you that you've got to be more conscious about the way you live in certain situations. It's reminding you of that, you know? And the reason why it gets crazy is we allow our mind to get involved. We take this little thing of fear in us, this reminder to be a little bit more conscious about the way we function and it turns it into a monster. And that monster takes over, controls us, and creates a nightmare out of our lives. So fear isn't necessarily, again, I, I know nothing is negative. Everything it depends upon how you use it. And yet fear is like a dominating emotional energy energy that controls the lives of so I mean people you know spend their lives looking for security because they are so afraid to step into the unknown so all of life is about building white picket fences around them to protect them from the world and you can't do it because ultimately the ultimate unknown is one day we die you know and that's where all fear comes from the fact that one day we're not here, all of this drama and melodrama and so on, you know, you know it's, it's like Shakespeare's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That's where all the fear comes from. But when you get over that in yourself and you begin to realize that life and death are really one and the same thing, that fear goes away. And then we're not afraid in life to step into the unknown, to go beyond ourselves, to open to higher energy, to open to things that are more profound, that maybe test us a little more than that white picket fence that we build around ourselves. And then you master fear. There becomes a kind of fearlessness. Not 100%. There's always going to be that buoy <laughs> sounding alarms. But you don't get wrapped up in it. Okay, I will listen. I have to be a little bit more careful how I function in certain situations. Does anyone else? Thank I hope you. that's clear, you know. Thank that, you. Yeah. And I was also reflecting on the fear you must have felt in that final uh, flight that you had with, with Rudy. Oh, when, no, I had no fear. Totally. You had no fear. I was turning around, I looked at Rudy, and suddenly hit a mountain. No fear. Beautiful. I mean, yeah, I had a little fear, but I brought it down. I said, well, what can happen? I'm with Rudy. <laughs> what could I kept telling myself that. I could see Bo fidgeting and nervous. And I said, you know what? He's supposed to live till 84. You know? So I just took all of that fear down below the navel. And I was turning. And then, you know, we hit a mountain. which was quite an experience, God bless. 
to be there the moment, the person you love more than anyone in the world, the person who gave you your life, you know, left, took his samadhi, totally unexpected. And probably the hardest thing I had to do in that situation is when we finally got off that mountain, I had to telephone his mother and tell her this. And it was, I mean, I mean, I had to just suck it up and just do, I couldn't because both Bo and Mimi were had fractured ribs and arms and they were a mess, you know? And I was bleeding, I was bleeding profusely. I had knocked out four teeth from the front of my face, you know? And I had to make that phone call. It was the hardest, one of the hardest things I ever had to do in my life to yeah. announce this to the world, you know? Does anyone else have a question you would like to ask? That's why, you know, people tell me their problems and their difficult situation, you know, and, you know, okay, you know, it'll pass, whatever it is, I promise you. And I think about some of the traumas I've been through in my life and I think, you know, what is this? If they don't work through this. How the hell are they going to have a spiritual life? Does anyone else have a question? Stuart, thank you so much for sharing that. It's really, wow, so grateful that you're here. So grateful for Rudy. Um, and I just wanted to ask if you could share another favorite mantra of yours, just a short one. Well, you know, I don't have any, you know, Sanskrit mantras and things like that you can sing, you know. I mean, I, I say things to myself, like I listen to the sound of Om, I live in the light of, you know, love, I am nothing at the center of the universe. That really works well for me. Just repeating that sometimes in the meditation. You know, I listen to the sound of Om. Sound of Om is God's wisdom entering our system. In order for that wisdom to enter, the mind has to be quiet. Crown chakra has to be open. You know, and it comes as the sound of Om. And then it disseminates, it, it goes into your system and each person is unique. So it comes out of us in a unique way according to exactly what we are, you know? And, you know, I, I do the, this a lot in, in the meditation class. I listen to the sound of Om. You know, I live in the light of love and the light of love is God's blessing to be able to live in the light of love. And I am nothing at the center of the universe. That's a little kind of prayer that came to me in the meditation and I use it. And I think if you try it, it'll help you, it'll work for you. Especially if you understand that, you know, God's wisdom is the own sound, you know? open to it, it comes in, it nurtures the whole chakra system. It brings with it, you know, actually all the wisdom in the history of the universe. And then I live in the light of love, which is God's blessing. And when I look out at all of you, I see the light of love. I see the love in the hearts of everyone sitting here and doing this meditation, my daughter, the people in my life, you know, it, it, it's extraordinary how life changed. Somebody like, you know, Larry asked me the other day, how has your life changed? The people, so I said, Larry, I'm sitting in front of 25 people here that I could have never sat in front of, you know, when I was 20 years old.
Thank you, Stuart. You're welcome. Does anyone else have a question? No, I'm going to go unpack my statues. I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these things are amazing. I mean, the, the whole energy of this apartment is going to change once they come out of that package. Okay, God bless you all. There'll be a class tomorrow evening. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Let's go statues. <laughs>